Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 APRU Sustainable Cities and Landscapes webinar series. Today's session is about cultural perspectives on urban water management in the Pacific, hosted by Professor Ken Yocum from the University of Washington and Professor Vicky Chance from the Victoria University of Wellington. So this webinar is our seventh webinar session in our uh, series. Thank you so much for everyone uh, for joining us. My name is Ye Gang Ko, Program Director of APRU System Cities and Landscapes Hub and Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Oregon. Before we get started today's webinar, I just want to mention a couple of things about APRU and our System Cities and Landscapes program. So for those of you who are not familiar with APRU, first of all, APRU is the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. It's a network of 60 leading universities linking the Americas, Asia, and Australasia. And we leverage collective education and research capabilities of our members into international public policy process. The Sustainable Cities and Landscapes program is one of the APRU's pro primary research programs and we collaborate on effective solutions to the challenge of the 21st century. And SCL Hub has 19 core members, universities of, across the Pacific Rim, and the hub is housed at the University of Oregon. The SCL Hub successfully held four annual conferences in Poland in 2017, and Hong Kong in 18, and Sydney in 2019, and virtually in Auckland in 2020. Each conference offered various activities that students can participate in, such as research working groups, design field school, a student design competition, and a research symposium for PhD students. This year, instead of our annual conference, we offer a live webinar series organized by our working groups, celebrating our fifth year anniversary. So after today, there are two more thematic webinars on the vulnerable and climate justice communities and uh, intertidal zones in December this year. And we are uh, in discussion in hosting two more webinars in early next year. Uh, lastly, um, one exciting news is the forthcoming Rowrich Handbook of Sustainable Cities and Landscapes in the Pacific Rim. This book will introduce the um, um, the new way of understanding sustainable cities and landscapes. The handbook includes over 60 case, case studies across the Pacific Rim, 64 chapters contributed by 116 authors from 38 institutions across the Pacific Rim, and including water section edited by the professor Ken Yoko. So I hope you continue to join us and explore how cities and regions across the Pacific Rim address climate change and social equity to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And please contact us through email um, and visit our website and Facebook or Instagram if you're interested in participating in our activities. And thank you so much. Um, and I will also let you know when would be our next webinar uh, through the chat. And so I hope you enjoy today's webinar. And now I'd like to pass on today's um, webinar host, Professor Ken Yocum and Vicky Chance. Thank you. Thank you, Yekon. I uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here and excited to uh, be able to uh, work with Vicky to help organize, um, organize this webinar. Uh, my name is Ken Yocum. I'm a faculty member and the chair of landscape architecture at the University of Washington um, in Seattle. And I'm located on the uh, shores of the Salish Sea, uh, the home of the Duwamish or the Duwamish people, um, their, their traditional lands, their current lands, as well as their future lands. And I'm honored to be able to uh, live, work, and study uh, with them on their lands. Uh, Vicki, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? You're muted. Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanakoto Kato, no United States, made China, Oku Tipuna, Itupu, Ake o United States, Ifana o Mai e o in New York. Um, no United States a how. Vicky Chance Toko Ingua, Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanakoto Kato. Um, I'm Vicky Chance. I'm a faculty member and the program director for landscape architecture 
here at Victoria University of Wellington, Teharenga Waka. Um, Wellington is located on the southern tip of the North Island of New Zealand. Um, and thank you um, all for joining us today. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you to APRU for hosting the webinar series, as well as to Ye Kang and to uh, Grace Graham, who's helping us with the, uh, the technical work behind the scenes. Um, thank you for setting this up. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, and we really appreciate this. Um, the title of our uh, the title of our webinar is Cultural Perspectives on Urban Water Management in the Pacific. Um, in the midst of of all that's going on now, and actually this week with with uh, COP twenty six in Glasgow, um, really engaging climate change conversations on a global scale once again, as we recognize ourselves in kind of a new COVID reality. Uh, bringing the conversations back to the forefront uh, regarding water and the importance of water. In 2019, the World Economic Forum um, declared access to clean water as the paramount for the future of global society. Um, on top of that, uh, UN uh, recently released their water plan for 2030, and the UN General Assembly uh, has launched um, a decade of water, um, really highlighting the priorities of water is an issue that we need to uh, be able to engage with and be able to uh, understand um, and be able to respond to, not just to solve the problems, but to seek opportunities in which we can um, provide uh, better, better places and living conditions, not only for uh, us and our communities, uh, but also for all of the other creatures and plants that um, reside in, in, in similar areas. And so, um, we really appreciate this kind of renewed attention and this focus back in and, and having this webinar as a uh, capacity to be able to, uh, to vocalize some of that. One of the reasons why we chose the title and the subject that we did is that within the global conversations um, that is uh, international and national, uh, from international and national institutions, there's a very top-down response. Of, of discussing need and priorities and, and setting policy and regulation um, for how we can manage and how we can understand water in different ways. And as Vicki and I were having discussions, we were realizing what was really missing was um, where the work was being done in the, in the communities in which the work um, is, is actually uh, playing out on the ground and in the water. And so uh, we brought this great group of panelists together um, who have put together wonderful presentations um, for us uh, to hear more about their research and their work and their priorities in that work, um, and to really think about, you know, how uh, we can really engage cultural perspectives and community actions for improving water conditions for our neighborhoods, for our cities, and for the places that, um, that they all live. And so thank you for joining us today. We're excited by these opportunity, the opportunity again, um, and we really hope you uh, uh, get a lot out of it. Uh, as we go through this conversation, uh, uh, a series of five different presentations, you'll see a Q&A button um, on the bottom or the side of your screen. We ask that you use that to uh, ask any questions that you may have along the way. There'll be a brief Q&A period at the end after the presentations. And so please ask questions um, through the Q&A um, and not necessarily through the chat. Um, within the Q&A, one benefit for that is if somebody asks a question that you like, you can always upload it so that it moves higher up in the list uh, and we can make sure that um, it gets addressed or responded to um, as, as well. Um, I think we have a jam-packed session, so we're gonna jump right in. And um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Coco Alicorn and uh, Rebecca Bachman uh, for the work that they're doing in Iquitos, Peru. And uh, Coco and Rebecca, would you like to introduce yourselves really briefly and then we'll jump in? Okay. Hi. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Coco Larcom. I am an architect, a landscape architect from Peru and, and I affiliated to the University of Washington to the landscape architecture department. And currently I'm uh, working on my PhD in public health. Hi there, and I'm Rebecca Bachman. I'm a landscape designer and a global health researcher through the Poverty International Center, uh, doing work based in Iquitos, Peru, as Ken said. Thank you all, and I think we're ready, Grace.
Hello, my name is Rebecca Bachman. I'm a landscape designer and global health researcher through the Fogarty International Center. Hi, my name is Coco Larcom. I am architect and landscape architect and global, research, global health researcher affiliated to UW and Sid Bay in Peru. Today, we're gonna to share our experiences and research in the city of Iquitos in the Peruvian Amazon. Iquitos is the largest city in the Peruvian Amazon, has half a million inhabitants and is surrounded by the Amazon rainforests and rivers. Around the city, there is an extensive floodplain where over 90,000 people live in amphibious communities. Amphibious communities are adapted to the seasonal changes of the river. They are built on stilts over the water level or float on the water and then land on the ground during the low river season. There is not a political framework for the development of these areas. Many of these communities lack safe housing, sanitation, and infrastructure, resulting in poor public health and destruction of the Amazon ecosystem. The community of Claverito is one of these communities. Claverito has 50 houses, 270 people, and hundreds of species of wild animals and plants. Claverito is no more than 35 years old. However, it shares the same challenges as any amphibious community. Residents of Claverito suffer from many health issues, including injuries, parasitic infections, chronic diarrhea, food insecurity, and depression. Since 2016, a multidisciplinary team from UW, Penn State, and CITBM from Peru have designed and built landscape architectural interventions in the community and assess the impacts on human and ecological health over time. Before the project began, we had a series of participatory workshops where residents shared their desires, needs, and priorities. At the same time, we had a multidisciplinary team that assessed health, environmental, and ecological conditions in the community. With the community and researchers' feedback, we defined the project. Later, in a series of other participatory workshops, the residents choose the project elements, such as material, color, and plant species. The community also constructs each project. Every member of the community was involved, from children to senior residents. We finalized the project with a series of educational and training workshops to learn how to take care of the garden and share preliminary findings of our research. The projects we have built so far in the first year are a community entrance and 28 floating gardens. In the second year, we built uh, the south entrance gardens and 31 floating gardens. And the last year in 2019, we built a community center with a community garden. This first project was built on the central access to the community that transformed from an informal waste landfill uh, to a community garden and stairs. The project removed trash accumulated for years in the area and replaced it with native plants to provide habitat and food. We installed in infiltration terrace gardens to clean the water coming down the hill before going to the river. The second project is in the south entrance of the community. That was a known spot for a crime um, neglected by the local municipality. Community volunteers cleaned the area and designed a paint a mural. And they connect this space to a new community garden. The new garden have, uh, is designed to provide habitat for local species and traditional medicine, medicinal plants for the residents. In 2019, we built a community center that has been used, uh, that is being used by not just the residents of Claverito, but uh, the rest of the people in Iquitos. Since the construction of this place, uh, the government have used the space to provide services to the residents of Claverito. The last component of the project are the floating household gardens. 
each family custom design and build their own garden with ornamental or artistic purposes or for food and medicine production. The impacts on health, ecology and environment are many. For example, after the eradication of almost six tons of trash, a pedestrians were used littering around the area uh, significantly. There was a in significant increase on biodiversity and abundance of species of birds, reptiles, and amphibians. A reduction of accidents in the community, an improvement on the perception of the community, a reduction of food insecurity, an increase on access to traditional medicine, improvements on mental health and well-being, and social health. Our team learned more than we expected in Claverito. During our research time, we found that the floating houses create habitat for aquatic vegetation that reduce the presence of E. coli and other coliforms in water. This is significant for the city of Iquitos that has no water treatment plant and draws the sewer directly to the river. Claverito is providing ecosystem services to the whole city. Another important finding is that the introduction of gardens changed the microbiome in people, in their guts, in their mouths, and also on the soil and in the water. The microbiome impacts several aspects of human health, including immune system, nutrition, hormone balance. Our team is still studying the preliminary results of this project. I'm now going to discuss a design research exploration built on the work that Coco just presented. This exploration centers around the overarching question of how can we expand how we think about urban infrastructure and design that supports human and ecological health living on water in a context like Claverito. These experiences in Claverito provided for the first time a robust body of evidence that can inform future design and research for the development of communities living on water. The instruments and methods listed here are those that Traction Design used to collect data in Claverito over the years of community participatory design work. One of the topics that the body of evidence allows us to explore is water-related health. I'm going to give a brief overview of a design research project built on that data. Most of the secondary analysis is of data from the highlighted bullet points here. Water-related health in Claverito includes all infectious diseases whose transmission is closely related to human relationships with water. These include mosquito-borne diseases, rat-related diseases, and waterborne parasitic bacterial and viral infections. The scope is quite broad because they all connect through water and the built environment in similar ways. This is an overview of the household surveys, schedule, and capture. There were six instances of data collection, and they varied between high river season, low river season, and transition seasons, which is important for this context where seasonality is a major variable. The percent capture averaged at 86% of households. From attractions data, I selected questions that relate to water-related health. Those questions asked about mosquito-borne diseases and waterborne parasitic bacterial or viral infections. Other questions asked people about where they go to the bathroom and what kinds of bathrooms they have and about mosquito bites and rat sightings. There were questions about solid waste management and about swimming and bathing, use of shoes and types of shoes, which can all offer hints at exposure to waterborne pathogens. I won't go through the results in detail, um, but across the board, evidence suggested myriad exposure pathways where built environment design could potentially help to improve water-related health. I used the social determinants of health framework for linking the data analysis to conceptual design solutions. Specific to water-related health, we see the individual at the center the incidence of infectious diseases relating at that small scale in the dark orange red portion of the wheel, then exposure to water related pathogens as a zoomed out determinant of those disease cases in the light orange ring of the wheel. Then zooming out to the green section, we see the built environment as a major factor that determines that exposure, 
such as how water is stored, how wastewater systems are designed and their effectiveness, the design of bathrooms, issues of drainage, ecological health, presence of mosquito habitat, and so on. Zooming out from there, we examine the largest scale determinants of water-related health in the blue ring. These include socio-political context, socioeconomic inequality, funding for improved water quality infrastructure, and the limitations of colonial conventional design in a context like the Amazonian floodplain. The design exploration that follows is really focused on the green section, on built environment interventions that might start to mitigate exposure to water-related pathogens at a community scale. The next step was to use data to define design problems. On the left, in the left column is a full list of water-related health topics for which data existed. Then we see a summary of findings on that topic and a brief narrative description of how each of those findings might relate to the built environment. And the final column on the right shows a subsequent design problem. In this summary, we start to see how a lot of the water-related health findings connect to the built environment in similar ways. For example, mosquito-borne diseases, mosquito bites, and soil-transmitted helminth parasitic infections all connect to drainage infrastructure. Frequent diarrhea and fever, presence of E. coli and coliforms in water quality tests, and outhouse design all connect to sanitation infrastructure. This diagram similarly shows how the data translated to design ideas. The blue and green circles are topics for which we have evidence, and the orange circles show design ideas stemming from that evidence. People are working on these design challenges around the world for communities living on and with water. So to conclude the project, using a section cut of the community of Claverito, I started to explore how certain design interventions might work in this amphibious context. Design questions that drove the exploration include, can seasonally floating pathways drain water away from people, reducing mosquito habitat and mitigating exposure to parasites and other pathogens? Can we design methods of solid waste management that are not habitable to mosquitoes and rats? Can, rain, can rainwater catchment help to provide sanitary water for household use without providing a breeding ground for mosquitoes? Can we design wastewater treatment systems that improve water quality in the community and that work both when the water is high and when it's low? And can we learn from mimic and scale up existing ecologies such as floating wetlands full of native aquatic vegetation and mosquito predators to create relatively low risk swimming areas and improve water quality overall? An idea behind these design exploration sketches is that perhaps the concepts could play a role in a future community meeting where if community members are excited about any of the ideas, they could be implemented, creating the opportunity for measuring the effectiveness of a design intervention in achieving any number of health related outcomes and ultimately reducing the burden of disease for the community. The interventions could be tested one at a time or combined and layered like previous community design build projects. There's room for a lot of design ideas. And this kind of data analysis and design exploration shows how we might be able to use a water related health framework to start to design scaled up interventions to support human and ecological health in Iquitos. Just in the Iquitos region, over 200,000 people live in amphibious communities, and an estimated tens of millions of people live in amphibious or floating communities worldwide, often informally. Next steps would be to develop architectural and urban planning solutions for the community of Claverito and other amphibious communities, and also to develop strategies for implementation of these concepts in the rest of the city, including prototyping, experimentation, and development of a political framework for development of communities living on water. One project in the very early planning stages now would assess the feasibility of implementing residential green spaces for health ecology and climate change resilience at the neighborhood scale in Iquitos through interventions in household gardens and green spaces. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Coco and Rebecca. Really appreciate uh, your efforts and your time and all of the work that you're doing 
um, you're doing currently, uh, as well as you have done uh, with the community of Pavarito and others. Um, we're going to transition now to Taiwan um, and hear from uh, Kui Xin Lao about uh, her work uh, with urban rivers and urban waterways uh, in Taiwan. You want to introduce yourself briefly, Kui Xin, and then uh, we'll jump into it. Hi everyone, uh, I'm associate professor with National Taipei University uh, in Taiwan, and I have a co-author of this presentation, uh, who is Lin Chi Ke from Observer Ecological Consultant Company. Thank you. Hello everyone. I am Liao Guixian from National Taipei University in Taiwan. This talk was prepared by myself and Lin Chi Ke from the Observer Ecological Consultant Company. I will present to you a case study on how citizens caring for the Baza River in Taiwan helps change its river management practices. The Baza River is in Taichung, Taichung is the second largest city in Taiwan. The river is about 12.5 uh, kilometers long. The river has received considerable attention in river engineering and river enhancement because its watershed is relatively recently developed compared to the city center of Taichung. And also because the high-speed rail Taichung station is located along the river. The Fazer River still supplies water for agriculture irrigation, even though it is largely an urban river. Like many other lowland rivers in Taiwan, the Fazer River has been channelized and levied. And the flow of the river is obstructed by many structures, such as ground seals for grade control and barrages for water supply. Moreover, the river is replete with garbage. It is not uncommon to see people just throwing bags of garbage into the river, which is of course illegal in Taiwan. On top of those conditions that are detrimental to river health, the River Management Office, which is the public agency that has the jurisdiction over the river, would clear the vegetation in the river on a regular basis. This is because a river landscape like this, although ecologically more beneficial, is considered unsightly and chaotic by many local residents. They would often pressure the river management office to remove the vegetation. The channel maintenance work would lead to vegetation completely removed in the river corridor, leaving a bare river. And this would occur periodically. However, such a river management practice is a major ecological disruption leading to massive deaths of animals. A Taichung citizen, Lin Ji Ke, who is also my co-author of this presentation, decided to make some change of these conditions. Lin Ji Ke is an ecologist and he has been bird watching and documenting fish species in the river. Before, Whenever he visited the river, he would pick up some trash, but this was done only in a casual fashion. In 2017, Lin Ji Ke witnessed colorful, dubious discharges from this outlet of a tributary. However, the river management office didn't think that the river pollution was their problem. Since then, Lin Ji Ke thought that he, as a citizen, should do something about the river pollution. Furthermore, in March 2018, when Lin Ji Ke was bird watching in the Fazi River, he saw two foreigners picking up trash in the river. He thought even foreigners are willing to care for the river. As a citizen, he should do more. He then decided to clean up the river on a regular basis. In April 2018, he invited some friends to join him to pick up trash in the river. After that event, he started a routine to devote at least one hour a week 
to clean up the Fazi River. He called this initiative Caring for Fazi one hour a week. However, he soon realized that his individual effort is simply not enough. The river was way, the river has way more trash than he can personally handle, and all kinds of trash, including animal bodies, medical waste, large furniture, and even best tops. To raise awareness of the garbage problem, he started to post his cleanup initiative on Facebook. His efforts successfully received attention, attracting not only friends, but also complete strangers to join him in the river cleanup. To get more people involved, Lin Tika also worked with Society of Wilderness, or SOW, to organize group cleanup events. SOW is the largest environmental NGO in Taiwan, and Lin Tika is also a member. The participants of the group cleanup events grew increasingly, and the group cleanup attracted the attention from the river management office. So in October 2018, the office formally collaborated with SOW to hold a cleanup event. In June 2019, SOW started to organize cleanup events on a regular basis every other week. It is not uncommon to see beach and river cleanups held by governments, NGOs, and businesses in Taiwan. However, those cleanups are usually one-off events. The cleanup initiative of the Fazi River is the only citizen-led regular river cleanups in Taiwan. In the beginning, feeling that very few would participate, they had to ask friends to participate in these events. But three months later, there were more interested people than they could handle. The River Cleanup Initiative has become so successful that SOW received enough donations to afford three four, four time staff members now to manage the regular cleanup events. SOW has been carrying out the cleanups as a citizen science effort since the first event they would sort the collected garbage. Between June 2019, when they first hold a group event, and September this year, SOW have organized a total of 60 regular cleanup events with a total of 4,652 participants. And they have collected a total of 8,900 kilograms of garbage. They found that cigarette butts accounts for the highest percentage of the garbage collected. An important effect of the Baza River cleanups is that it changes the view of the public agencies towards the environmentalists. Public agencies in Taiwan tended to consider them a headache when they criticized the government for ecological or environmental problems. The civil servants would view environmentalists to be only paying lip services, although this is not necessarily a fair view. But the Father River cleanups demonstrate that actions speak louder than words. The public agencies see that the concerned citizens would take actual actions to care for the river instead of just pointing fingers to the government for its neglect of the garbage problem. The cleanup initiative has earned the respect and trust from the public agencies, leading to formal and informal collaborations between Lin Tike and the civic servants in the river management office to foster some positive changes in the river. One of the changes involved the change in river management. Backed by many concerned citizens involved in the cleanups, in March 2019, Lin Ke successfully convinced the River Management Office to change the channel maintenance practice. The office now understands that a well-vegetated riparian zone is important to river health. Instead of clean, clearing all the vegetation in the river like before, now 
the office would leave a width of three to five meters of vegetation untouched along the channel. This photo shows the result of a more ecologically friendly channel maintenance work. In this section, the upper part of the bank is still mowed regularly to meet the expectation of the local residents, while the vegetation in the lower part is preserved as the riparian zone to provide ecological benefits. Furthermore, this upstream section is left entirely undisturbed as it harbors many waterfowls and has been identified as an ecological hotspot. In 2020, Lindsay Kerr further convinced the River Management Office to diversify the river habitat. The Father River naturally should be a braided river. However, channelization has made it an unnatural single channel river. Since the River Management Office would regularly hire excavator for channel maintenance, he convinced the office to use that excavator to create a side channel in order to make river geomorphology more natural and to expand the aquatic habitat. One month later, one month after this work was done, many native fish species have been observed in the newly created habitat. Besides changing the river management practices, citizens' cleanup efforts also motivate the river management office to start taking action to tackle the garbage problem, which they previously didn't think was theirs because their main responsibility is flood management. The office have budgeted to set up trash barriers in the upstream section of the Fazer River in hope to reduce trash downstream. While this does not address the root cause, it is still a beginning of the river management office to address the garbage problem. Interestingly, because the river management office has been more or less working with Lin Ji Ke and SOW in river cleanups and river management, they have taken pride in it and consider it to be their major achievement of citizen involvement because it is currently a highly important agenda in, the, in governance in Taiwan. The office would present, present their collaboration with the citizens in river cleanups Uh oh, technical problem. As a successful case to other river related public agencies. So here is the take home message. This case study of the Baza River, along with other cases that we've known in Taiwan, shows that it is possible for a citizen to make some change as long as the person is willing to take actions and remains persistent. Changes from the bottom up is entirely possible and can take place sooner than expected. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kui uh, for a terrific presentation and and for really showing the capacity for uh, an, an individual to really help make change um, in, in a whole variety of different ways. Um, we're now gonna jump across the Pacific um, uh, to my own region uh, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States and hear from uh, Nancy Roddle and Jen Engelke. Nancy and Jen, would you like to introduce yourselves briefly? Yes, hi everyone, I'm Nancy Roddle. I'm a professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture in the College of Built Environments at the University of Washington. And I direct the UW Green Futures Lab. Jen? Hey everyone, my name is Jen Engelke and I'm a landscape architect and PhD candidate in the College of Built Environment at University of Washington. And I've worked with Nancy in the uh, Green Futures Lab. Well, hello and welcome to our webinar session on community engagement in living shorelines research projects. My name is Nancy Roddle. 
I am the director of the UW Green Futures Lab and have uh, overseen these projects. And I'm here with Jen Engelke, who's a PhD candidate uh, in the College of Built Environments and has been involved in all of these phases. The first, um, to give some background, Seattle sits on the Salish Sea, of which Puget Sound is a part, with our major rivers fed by streams, draining into the Puget Sound estuary from the Cascade Mountains and foothills. This hydrologic system has historically supported huge populations of salmon, five species, which hatch in cold streams, swim down those streams and rivers into the sound, out to the Pacific, and then after three to four years, miraculously find their way back to their natal streams to lay their eggs and then die, completing a whole cycle. But the decline of salmon populations in Puget Sound has been precipitous, landing the Puget Sound Chinook salmon on the threatened list and subsequently the southern resident orca population on the endangered list with only 74 of those individuals remaining. And it's believed that their decline is in large part due to lack of the salmon that make up a large portion of their diet and that's especially Chinook. Salmon and other aquatic species need clean, cold water and healthy shoreline habitat upon which they depend for food and refuge. But with competing uses for the water's edge, much of Puget Sound's shorelines have become armored for their urban and industrial uses, which in many cases need to remain, providing essential services and jobs. And the red areas uh, on this map show the urbanized shorelines in Puget Sound. The Duwamish River is one of two watershed outlets in Seattle where juvenile swimming back down the river need to make it through the gauntlet of the Duwamish's industrial shoreline to Puget Sound. These baby salmon need all the help they can get so they can fatten up, adapt from fresh to salt water to survive the challenges of Puget Sound and swim out to the Pacific and then back to return to their natal streams or perhaps out in the ocean or sound to feed an endangered orca. And not only are there challenges throughout the watershed, but the mouth of the Duwamish has been converted to an industrial waterway losing the historic meanders, mudflats, and shoreline wetlands of the former river. And due to industrial and urban pollution, this part of the Duwamish has been designated a much studied Superfund site, which is designated for very polluted sites. It's a federal government designation. So we asked the question, can new kinds of living shorelines replace lost shoreline habitat the juvenile salmon need for food and refuge as they make their way from their natal streams to Puget Sound in the ocean. And we've mostly focused on floating wetlands, which can provide multiple benefits to aquatic environments. Insect and organic litter provide food, while microbes and biofilms on the roots and substrate can remove and process pollutants. We started with researching floating wetlands, both natural and human-made, and uh, then we designed and built prototypes that especially could be deployed in the Lower Duwamish River. Um, this was offered as an interdisciplinary seminar through our landscape architecture department. <clears throat> then applying criteria related to both juvenile salmon requirements and the need for our staff to monitor their effectiveness, we tried different prototypes and ended up using pontoons that would hold not only the floating wetlands, but also ourselves to conduct research. Then we constructed four bio barges with these floating wetlands or biofilters and deployed them in the lower reaches of the Duwamish River. The goal of this Duwamish floating wetlands project was to determine if constructed floating wetlands could increase salmon habitat and improve water quality to support the survival of the outmigrating juveniles. And here's a detail of the biofilter that used layers of substrates suspended within a metal gabion. I won't go into detail about that. <laughs> we monitored the floating wetlands for plant growth, fish use, durability, invertebrate production, which would be food for the salmon, and potential water quality benefits over the course of two years. And here you can see how the structure of the bio barges allowed us to walk 
and sit it on the structure to monitor the biofilters. This design construction research work was done through the University of Washington Green Futures Lab with funding and in-kind support from the Port of Seattle and the King County Waterworks Program and a grant from the Rose Foundation, the latter specifically to create and implement a community science program, which Jen will now tell you about. Thanks, Nancy. Today, we're focusing on the community engagement aspects of this project. I want to begin by saying these programs would not have been possible without Adrian Hampton, Ashley Powell, and Leanne Andrews. Leanne was the project manager that led the team in 2019 and 2020. Adrian and Ashley were both paid community science and outreach coordinators that set up these programs and worked to bring the community and research together. They worked to have each week in the field have a team out with us to take measurements for water quality, plant health, and salmon observation. We were able to pay research scientists to help us with the data collection, and data scientists ranged from those who were just starting college to retired boat captains to PhD students in the fisheries department here at UW. While community scientists brought knowledge to our collection efforts, they were also able to learn our research methods along the way. During 2019, Adrian worked hard to set up an outreach program that we could interact with the community whether it was with middle school students from the Pacific Science Center or having a booth, booth at the Duwamish River Festival. It was fun to talk with people about the floating wetlands and even have the kids make mini floating wetlands to take home with them. Between 2019 and 2020, we used adaptive design strategies to modify the wetlands based on the research results from, the, from year one in hopes that they could create better habitat for salmon. Leanne Andrews, Alicia Kellogg, and Mason Bowles had a Lands had a floating wetlands workshop course that was taught through the landscape architecture department where students learned about the floating wetlands and helped construct new units to be added to the bio barges that were already in the water. We had great plans for year two and right as we were starting to get those units installed and the research started, COVID had hit real hard. And so community science became essential during this period. Edwin Hernandez Rito was already on the team for year two to help with community outreach, but he's also a mechanical engineer that was working on other projects in the Duwamish River watershed as well and lived in the, in the neighborhood. So Edwin went out to check on and repair the floating wetlands during COVID when we weren't able to go to the site. We were also able to hire his high school age son, Sebastian, and family from Maria to go with him and take data measurements when UW researchers couldn't be in the field. Oops. Uh, David Shimate um, also was another neighbor to this project who offered that we could actually put a couple of the bio barges at his dock. And because it was his property, he went out every day to take a look and take data measurements for us as well. And so the community science team was really essential during these peak COVID times. We also were able to still have community scientists learn with us with the invertebrates. And so paid community scientists learned about invertebrate identification and were able to help us process all the samples in the lab. COVID also allowed us to still hire Doris Duke scholars as community scientists to work with us remotely to promote the project through blogs and social media. Since our scholars were in Seattle, they were even able to join us in the field to learn more about the project that way. And this was unique for the Doris Dukes, Dukes program as not all the programs were able to continue during COVID, but we were actually able to have two scholars work with us. The community science became possible with the support of the Rose Foundation. We were able to hire some great leaders with Leanne, Adrian, and Ashley, and they each designed innovative ways that we could interact with the community members thanks to the great team on this project. We wrapped up the uh, Duwamish Floating Wetlands project, uh, decommissioned the floating wetlands, but, and we're now working on the Sweetgrass Living Shoreline Restoration Project, which is in the other watershed that runs through Seattle, which is a totally freshwater watershed. 
And for that project, we've hired a skilled Indigenous project and community outreach coordinator, Tim Lehman, who has helped us establish what we call an Urban Shores Working Group, which is comprised of scientists, designers, permitters, municipal staff, and citizen activists. And here are examples of some of the organizations that our Urban Shores Working Group represents. So as I said, working in the other watershed outlet that runs through Seattle, then we held a charrette with the Urban Shores Working Group to propose living shoreline prototypes on six sites that our team identified and then prioritized. And then after which we chose two sites for implementation. To start the building process, our grant allowed us to partner with a local NGO, Earth Corps, with targeted outreach to also involve local Indigenous youth and to hire Edwin as an ind Indigenous steward to keep continuity from the Duwamish project to the new locations in freshwater. We also had a volunteer boat captain to help us with the installations, and this whole team worked together in order to build these new prototypes for Sweetgrass. With everybody's help and then support, we got new units and designs installed at the Fremont Bridge and South Lake Union in Seattle. With this project again, we were able to hire community scientists to come out with us each week to take, to take plant measures. And we had middle schoolers to high school age students come spend the day with us to learn about floating wetlands and came out on the boat to see all the different prototypes in the field. To create ways of engaging general public, we formed a Sweetgrass Arts Group that got a grant from the City of Seattle Neighborhood Matching Fund to hire local artists to help us find ways to explain the floating wetlands and engage the local community. We asked for banners and fish stencil designs and poems to reflect the project. The local artists, Tamila LeClaire, Owen Oliver, Susan Haas, and Julianne Paschkis created banners, fish stencils, and poems to represent salmon and the floating wetlands. Each artist was compensated and the Sweetgrass Arts work group worked to print and install these in the landscape. We had a community event on Sunday, November 7th to have the community help us paint the salmon on this trail. A huge thank you to King County and the Rose Foundation for the funding of the Sweetgrass Project and to Seattle Neighborhood, Seattle Department of Neighborhoods for supporting the Sweetgrass Arts Project. The, banner will reside, the banners will reside at the floating wetlands for the next few months. So uh, in summary, there are multiple ways we've employed community engagement in this academic research project. First, uh, with collaborative prototype development and construction, <clears throat> both in the academic context with our students and also partnering with local nonprofit organizations. We've conducted targeted outreach for both volunteer and project employment opportunities uh, through our, for our community science programs. And uh, likewise, uh, through our community scientists, we were able to uh, conduct greater field monitoring as well as lab research. And um, through a stakeholder and expert advisory group engagement, we were able we were able to expand our ideas of what were possible. And also they've helped us with greasing uh, the permitting wheels, which can, can be difficult, as you may know. And we were been able to have some fun educational uh, experiences with youth to get them inspired, and also to engage artists uh, and to be able to mount a successful community event. So, what lessons did we learn? Well, first that community involvement can, from construction to research to maintenance can make the project be more fun, more exciting, perhaps more impactful and more equitable. And in fact, community engagement can be critical to the success of a project. But a true exchange of local and scientific knowledge and engagement of the local public really does take work. And so you need trained, organized and flexible leadership who can understand and relate to the various communities who've been invited. And um, of course, funding is needed to support that leadership, as well as equity in compensating community members who are, are volunteering their time, often with other jobs. And there are undoubtedly untrackable ripple effects of the impact 
Um, it's hard to know what the impact would be on educationally, um, but they are definitely important to advance equitable STEAM learning, science, technology, en engineering, arts, and mathematics learning. So we hope that you will also find success with your uh, research projects that engage the community. And we want to thank you for listening today. We'll be here for questions either right away or at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful talk. <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, it, it's been so wonderful hearing about everyone talk about all these different case studies. I'm now going to bring us over to um, New Zealand, Aotearoa. And so first, I'd like to introduce um, Tina Perot, who is here in spirit, um, and we do have a recording of her lecture. Uh, Tina Perot is going to be giving us sort of the large scale perspective of um, water issues, water management um, in, in Aotearoa. So Tina Perot is of Ngati Perot, Ngati Tufaratoa, Ngati Kahunbunu, and Gai Tamunu Hiri. She's an environmental planner and consultant at Poipoya Limited in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, this company is a Kapapa Maori company committed to providing environmental services to iwi, the public and private sectors. She's worked in the natural resource management field for over 20 years. Um, there is a whole lot more to say about her, but um, I'm going to have to be short on time <laughs> with that and we'll, we can start her lecture. So Grace, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. Uh, tēnā tātou katoa, he mihi atu kei a koutou mō tēnei uh, kōrero. Uh, my name is Tina Brau, and I'll be talking about te mano te wai e mā tauranga Māori today. Uh, so, as I said, my name is Tina Brau. I am an environmental planner and have been one for about 20 years, focusing primarily on uh, Māori resource management and um, focusing also on freshwater geothermal and climate change. So I've been working in this field for a long time and primarily focused on working for tribes and uh, indigenous tribes in Aotearoa. So having been unsure and, and trying to figure out the, the um, knowledge base of our participants, I've just got a few slides today to go through some contextual information, which I hope will be helpful for the conversation. Um, so Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, the indigenous people of Aotearoa are often called Māori. However, we have multiple uh, tribes and sub-tribes that, that scatter and cover the entire two islands of, of Aotearoa. And Māori as a collective group are around 850,000 in number, or about 16.7% of our entire population. And we continue to own around 5.6% of New Zealand's total land, so we've got about 1.5-ish million hectares. And this is land that was um, not confiscated by the British Crown in the 1800s and, and is still retained in our ownership. But as you can see, we've lost most 95% of our land holdings as a result of colonisation uh, due to British settling in New Zealand in the, in the mid 1800s. So that kind of relationship as um, a colonised group of people, uh, although it doesn't deter us from seeking our own tinoranga uh, tiratanga or mana motihake, uh, mana motihake uh, across our own land. So we retain that irrespective of Crown colonisation. Um, but we have a really unique and important relationship with the natural environment and, this, and indigenous communities. So for myself, I am Māori. Uh, my tribes are many, but my, my primary tribes are Ngāti Pro, which is my father's people, and Ngāti Tuwharetoa, which is my mother's people. And so we have a unique connection directly to the natural environment through our genealogy, which is an important premise of our uh, cultural, spiritual and social structures. But just to, I guess, give you some further context. So the Treaty of Waitangi, or more known to us, Te Tiriti or Waitangi, uh, is our country's founding document. And so Māori worked tirelessly 
uh, to ensure that that constitutional document is upheld, that those promises that were made by the Crown, which were breached quite soon after its signing and continue to be breached, and, and we still deal with the issues of that breach today, uh, are upheld. So the Treaty of Waitangi is an important component. And I've only got about 12 minutes today, so I apologise if that's the um, very compressed uh, contextual version, but, but it would be very easy to go online um, and people uh, have written a lot of work that, that I would recommend around the space, for example, Sir Mason Jury has written some great books and um, also Ranginui, Dr Ranginui Walker are two good um, sources of information for more contextual background on the colonisation and subsequent socio-economic changes for Māori as a result of that settlement. So I wanted to start with a, again, a contextual conversation before we get to water and uh, legislation around the spiritual connection that Tangata Whenua, which is another um, way of describing the indigenous communities of, of Aotearoa, connect to the natural environment. So, so in our traditional um, oral history around how the worlds were created, uh, we have two beings, Ranginui, the Sky Father, and Papatuanuku, the Earth Mother, and in their embrace um, held together, they had multiple children. And from those children uh, comes a genealogical descent and people are part of that gene genealogical descent. So we come from ta uh, sorry, Tane Mahuta, who you can see on this geological, a genealogical chart. And he is often uh, talked about as the God of forests and birds and also people through his relationship with Hine, um, Hine Ahu, uh, sorry, with um, the dawn maiden Hine Titama who later become, became Hemenui Te Pō. And this is a slide that is taken from Charles Royal. So he's a, a very well-known Māori academic, so you can get more information about that, that relationship through his teachings. But we consider ourselves to be of the environment, not in dominion over. So the relationship comes from this genealogical connection that says we're actually family. We're family and cousins and brothers and sisters to the wind, to the sea, to the fish, to food, to, to each other. Um, and so I think that has formed a really important relationship amongst all of the components of the natural resources and ecosystem that we all live in, which is quite different to a colonial view that was brought over, which is, you know, we are, we are here, the, the environment is here to look after us and to be able to serve our needs and as such it is allowed to be exploited. So for tangata whenua, for Māori in, in Aotearoa, um, that, that relationship is, is more of a alignment with each other uh, and uh, interdependency rather than a exploitative relationship. So you know those relationships go deeply to our spiritual connection to fresh water which is what I'm going to be talking briefly about today. And that fresh water relationship is innately a part of who we are. We are uh, brothers and sisters of fresh water. They are our family. And as such, we have a, a serious and strong sense of responsibility uh, to these taonga, these, these important um, parts of our family. And as such, our decision-making is reflective of that relationship. Also, our Maparanga Māori, which is our traditional knowledge base, which has been built on thousands of years of observation and oral history, this type of knowledge that is derived from a familial relationship ends up being able to provide, from our point of view, the solutions to some of the environmental issues and degradation and, to be honest, um, tragedy that we're seeing across the world. We see the answers being in our traditional customs and practices that saw us living in good alignment and interdependency rather than in um, what we're seeing now, which is a, a negative outcome on our natural environment. So if I go to a, a, the next conversation, brings us back into, I guess, the, the physical world a little bit more. The current state of waterways in Aotearoa, New Zealand, for us is becoming dire. So we have increasing concerns across Aotearoa around water quality and its use. So we have some significant concerns around nutrients going into our waterways, uh, climate change, 
We also have uh, significant concerns about over allocation for different uh, industry uses. And as a result of that kind of exploitative relationship, uh, we're seeing significant declines around the country in our ability to drink from, uh, swim in, and have a strong relationship with our freshwater sources. Particularly for Māori, our ability to feed ourselves from our waterways has significantly declined as a result of regulatory uh, enabling of pollution and also uh, just, just land use choices that have caused some real uh, concerns around the quality and quantity of our freshwater. So Māori, Tangata Whenua, have been battling to be partners in making decisions over environmental regulation since the signing of the treaty. And the treaty has enabled some engagement and uh, the establishment of some partnerships, or well, I should say relationships, they're not quite partnerships yet, relationships with regulatory authorities like councils and central governments. But Māori continue to advocate for much stronger decision-making power around how water is managed. And an example of this is the, um, a range of treaty settlements that were negotiated between the iwi who have been impacted uh, as a result of colonisation and breaches of the treaty and the Crown. And they have come up with a range of um, opportunities to be able to have better power sharing and to protect these natural resources more effectively. So for example, uh, Waikato Painui has a significant treaty settlement that really puts them at the heart of management of their awa, their river, the Waikato River. Um, and then we also have another great example, which is with the Whanganui people and their personhood status for the Whanganui River. So there are lots of, I guess, unique and um, innovative ways that Iwi and Māori have been trying to address the decline to ensure that their waterways are clean and healthy and to firmly centre themselves as guardians, protectors and sustainable users of, of fresh water in partnership with the Crown, which is promised under the Treaty of Waitangi, but has never really been given effect to. So what I'm going to talk to you briefly about next is uh, Te Mano Te Wai which is a concept, a Māori indigenous concept that was developed by iwi and hapū across the country, so tribes and sub-tribes, to try and address the decline of fresh water. And now te mano o te wai, this concept is entrenched in the National Policy Statement on Fresh Water, which um, again can be found online, uh, but integrates and essentially is the umbrella uh, concept for the whole National Policy Statement on Fresh Water. And so I'll just briefly describe what Te Mano o Te Wai is in the context of the policy. So Te Mano o Te Wai, as I said, was derived from Kōrero with our Iwi Chairs Forum across the country. So we have a group of most of the tribes in New Zealand who collectivise across universal, universal issues. So Te Mano o Te Wai was developed and designed and it came out of that space and then was extended um, through Kahui Waimari, which is a Crown Advisory Group, um, which got us to the point today, those two, those two kind of extensions, which has provided a very powerful tool um, for iwi Māori to be able to participate and, and have better decision making over waterways and how not only our participation in the process, but also transforming the the premise that fresh water should be used until it runs out. So Te Mano o Te Wai is a concept that says the first right to water goes to water. So it centralizes water rather than people and says, we need to make sure that the water has its own opportunity and is unfettered to be able to live as it should be, as fresh water. So for its, if its own health and well-being, for the well-being of its constituent parts, and the, the taonga species, the water and the, sorry, the fish and the insects and everything else that lives naturally in those waters. So Te Mano o Te Wai says the first right of water must go to what water, it's a hierarchy. The second part of Te Mano o Te Wai is around enabling, ensuring that as long as the first right of water goes to water so it can thrive, then what is left over can be shared with people who are using it appropriately and give effect to the first right. And then the third part of Te Mano Te Wai was always about regeneration and restoring the things that we had broken. Now, 
as a result of the national policy statement, we have the opportunity to be able to start to transform the way in which uh, freshwater is being managed. And I have to say it's going to be very difficult because it's a transformative change rather than an incremental one. Um, so under the national policy statement, Te Mano o Te Wai is required to be implemented by 2024 in all of the planning doc documents for local government. And that's proving a challenge for not only um, councils, but for the tribes who are partnering with councils to try and achieve a, a different outcome. So this, this particular slide, which I won't go through because I'm running out of time, but um, this slide talks about how uh, tangata whenua indigenous groups should be partnering as a result of te mano o te wai, how they should be uh, expressing their values for the water that they want, the objectives for the water that they want, how they will measure them, and how they will use Māori knowledge or Māperanga Māori to continue to uh, monitor and enforce the expectations of te mano o te wai as a policy hierarchy. So, you know, um, this is a very, very short snapshot, but I hopeful, I'm hopeful it's helpful to kind of say Te Mano Te Wai is an umbrella policy intervention designed by the Indigenous community to be able to try and save fresh water in this country. It provides permission for councils to change the way they allocate water and how they manage water quality to enable it to be centred water at its centre, not the advocacy of, of many user groups. And it will be a, a steep transition to unpick the infrastructure that enables that system. But Te Mano o Te Wai comes from a place of, of actual love for water, for a familial connection that is only unique to tangata whenua, to Māori with those waters. And it's focused also on making sure that the tribes have the decision-making power and influence over the decisions that are being made for waterways that they connect to. So um, hopefully that was helpful and I've, I've dotted through a, a few references. I also have written the guidelines for the implementation of this particular freshwater policy statement and that will be made public um, at the end of the month. But hopefully that was helpful. Thank you for having me. He mihi atu kia koutou katoa. Thank you to Tina for that wonderful presentation, looking at this sort of large scale cultural perspective. Now we're gonna shift, we're still staying in New Zealand um, in Aotearoa, and I'd like to turn it over um, and allow Cody Brown to introduce herself. She is a master's in landscape architecture student here at Victoria University of Wellington, Te Haringa Waka. Um, and I'm, I've been so interested in her thesis project, so I'm so pleased she was able to present it to us today. Um, just a short explanation of where I'm from and what waters I come from that's in New Zealand. And um, yeah, as Vicky uh, really said, I'm an MLA student in Victoria University of Wellington, and I've just been presenting my thesis. Yeah, thank you. Kia ora, my name is Cody, and through my working title, Reconnecting Mātauranga, I would be encouraging a resilient community through cross-cultural frameworks, the Māori and non-Māori in New Zealand. And so through development and colonization, there has been a significant amount of Māori land loss from 80% down to 4% of Māori land currently um, in hold from Māori for Māori. This affects the overall problem of vulnerable streams urban streams in the development area and uh, vulnerable to population growth. So the current pressures of sea level rise as well as flooding currently affect, affects all urban streams and urban communities. So how can integrating Māori practices within the natural environment 
can be an opportunity to enhance urban streams and reconnect people back to their landscapes. So how can I bring Mataranga Māori, Māori knowledge into integration in the development of vulnerable urban streams? Um, I've looked at Mataranga Māori as a whole network of the Te Ao Māori lens, Māori worldview, and brought out some concepts that I'd like to work with. Um, one is Ki Uta Kitai, is from the mountains down to the sea. How can the whole catchment be integrated? And the knowledge of the whole catchment help enhance the um, health of the water. Currently, the Greater Wellington region um, has 40% of its population living within the Wellington City District and 8.5% are Māori. That is Māori that may not have, that have shifted there or have been there for their whole lives. How is it reflected in the design development? Um, the current iwi, the Māori communities that take care of the land and live off of the land, um, within the Wellington city are called Taranaki Whanui ki te upoko o te ika. And this is made up of many Māori communities that were once the first settlers and caretakers of Wellington city. My um, site resides within Ngāti Tama Hapu of Taranaki, just further up north. And the whole catchment, is one of the largest ones in Wellington City. So how can we take care of that? One project that I've looked at is Sanctuary to Sea project, where they bring out Ki Uta Ki Tai, is taking care of the mountainous um, environment straight down to the estuary's house. Um, and I've looked into the ecologies in design by Rebecca Kittle. She's helped me bring out a list, a, holistic framework um, response for non-Māori and Māori to address um, problems that are affecting Māori communities. And the water cycle for the restoring Māori, and that's brought about many um, terms and concepts which need to be integrated into design, development and practice of looking after um, the water cycles of Wellington and New Zealand really. So the cycles go from rainwater, fresh water, dead water, earth, and then into the sea water. Um, for Kaiwharafara catchment, I've looked at the past Māori settlements and how it's changed through modification, and then how it looks with the current urban development and the type of land cover on top going more into what these Māori settlements look like today and how it's been retained and how the streams have been piped underneath some industrial areas, which we see in Kaiwharafara estuary. Um, so what steps and what parts of the Māori cycle are currently occurring? That's what I'd like to see. And with the whole catchment in line, I'd like to focus on connecting the sanctuary to see projects with the gaps that I see in the piped um, streams as well as the vulnerable lands of flooding and contaminated lands in the industrial area. So can I bring about um, maybe opening the stream? Um, we'll see. And the stormwater management is quite um, I'll say essential in my project. So how can I look at opening up the pipe streams and connecting the community back straight to the water, as well as enhancing the open streams, making it more accessible for cultural practices and the estuary to bring back the biodiversity as it's currently at risk due to low quality habitat and its risk of sedimentation during flooding. So what cycle of the water the Māori of the water is currently happening and what interactions of Mātauranga can I bring about if it is needed. Thank you.
Thank you, Cory, for that. And with that, that um, ends the presentation part of this webinar. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the Q&A and nobody has posted any questions. Um, I know we'd had a few questions to start, so we could um, just ask our panelists that unless you'd like to do something. What are your thoughts, Ken? Uh, let's go with the questions that we've prepared. Okay, terrific. Um, so first is thinking about all of these um, different cultural perspectives um, and partnerships, how have they um, sort of led to different outcomes or processes than say more a more traditional um, civil engineering approach to these projects? Um, I think for me, I've talked to um, a Zealandia Reserve um, Māori specialist who's brought about special mātauranga Māori within the um, catchment, and she's given out specific um, health assessments she's been taking. So I think just more specific problems to the area have come through instead of some generalised fixing of it. Yeah. I'll, I'll just respond um, with an example from our Duwamish floating wetlands in how we actually helped to shift priorities um, with the port of Seattle, who had, has many traditional port responsibilities and priorities. But our first year, we had a grant to start this community science program. And then they jumped on the wagon and uh, actually helped us help support the community science program in the second year. So I think when they saw what uh, the impact of the community could be, especially working in the lands where that are adjacent the shorelines uh, and in those communities, um, then it it helped to shift their thinking. So I think that's a part of um, of the role of what we're doing you know, in our work at the university is, is trying to shift uh, perception and then practice policy and practice. Thanks, Corey and Nancy. Any, do any of our other panelists want to respond to that question? I guess I'll add on to what Nancy had said um, about this, but kind of look at the other projects. So look at Sweetgrass. Um, and it, I think looking at the different partnerships that we had through the Urban Shore Workings Group um, that that allowed us to, that kind of drove the site selections that we had and some of the design um, prototype um, pieces. And so it, by bringing together all these different people and um, forming this partnership that we had, we were able to also navigate permits and th things like that um, a lot easier because we already had contacts with a lot of the agencies um, instead of kind of starting fresh. So that was really helpful. Thanks. We do have one question on the Q&A. Um, someone was asking for the master's student um, presentation within your research, is there an architectural intervention that you are proposing that can enhance or enable correct stormwater management while at the same time enabling housing development? So I don't know if that's directed for you, Kori. Um, yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Um, there hasn't been an architectural intervention, but I've just been looking at how businesses around the surrounding um, catchment right at the end at the estuary can be more immediately involved with making maybe the parking spaces into stormwater management areas. So not really architectural interventions at this point. Yeah. Thanks, Cody. Some of the other questions we had for the panelists, I know we're running, we've only got about five minutes left to the official time. Um, 
So each of these presentations prioritized the importance in terms of the relationship between different constituent groups, different communities. How have each of you navigated this process in terms of, you know, potentially what are could be competing priorities, or how did you approach it? I can answer uh, that from our perspective. Uh, in our project, the participatory process have uh, three goals. So we want to first three layers, if we want to say. The first layer is trying to identify uh, desires. So basically let them dream and think about what anything they want. And the second layer is then uh, define what are actually needs. So the community by, it, by themselves, they start to classify, okay, these are things that are essential for us. And finally explained uh, from a project management perspective, that we cannot address many of these uh, uh, needs. So what would be your priorities if we have a limited time and budget for a project? So uh, I, I think that has been key for us for keep a very transparent process and uh, keep the, a good relationship with the community. Thank you, Coco. Anyone else? Um, I do have one more question. Um, when we're, you know, again, thinking about all the different wonderful projects you have, each of you have been talking about, um, you know, when you think about the various cultural and community-based perspectives, um, when you think about these sort of impacts, how do you think they might influence and inform larger policies or even just larger international intercontinental approaches as you reflect back on some of those projects? I'll just say that the power of um, precedents are, is huge. And if we can publicize the results of those precedents, uh, and that includes the scientific outcomes of uh, the, the kinds of prototypes that we're testing, but it also includes the process and the process of uh, engaging the public because ultimately it's that public perception and demand, at least at the local level that, um, that drives uh, policy. Uh, and then that can then translate up to state, national and international policies and, and then funding as well. Thank you, Nancy. Anyone else? I guess to add on to Nancy for a second, um, I think also thinking about these floating room projects that we were doing were um, prototypes. And so using that research um, as they are, you know, not currently always under policy with the city of um, Seattle. And so, um, but by being able to do it through research and through um, permits that way, um, that has been really helpful. And so um, just continuing to be able to um, try new things with research grants, um, I think was really important. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jen. So I know we're running, we're almost done, done. I would like to use this time, first of all, to thank each of you. It's been so inspiring, you know, to look at these different scales and look at these different built projects and conceptual projects and just sort of the, the huge range really in terms of design interventions and perspectives um, in addressing water, stormwater, um, freshwater quality issues through design approaches and interventions. Um, I don't know if you've all seen the note from Yikong um, about the next upcoming webinar she wanted you know, to remind us is on November 29th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, looking at the intersection between systemic vulnerability, community resilience, climate justice, and sustainability. Um, but thank you again to all of our panelists. I know managing this across three time zones was not an easy task. <laughs> um, so I wanna thank you. And Ken, um, if you have, I don't know if you have any final words for everybody. 
I, Vicky, I think I would just be repeating what your, your thanks as well as I uh, appreciate all of the panelists for um, putting their time and efforts into the presentations. It was a wonderful collection of, of work that's really being done at the local level and on the ground and, you know, um, where these policies and these regulations at a larger level are coming coming into play, we can see that you know there's activities and there's actions that are already happening. And so what's being proposed isn't necessarily new and the opportunity to really support those on the ground efforts across the Pacific and across the world are, are really viable and, and there and available. So thank you. Thank you. So with that, we'll We'll close. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or follow up comments. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.